Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is now the ninth episode of season four. We're almost at the end of the season people. If I sound and look a bit rough this week it's because I am. I saw The Offspring last night with my mate Dav. The funny thing is that we got separated when the band came on. We both enjoyed the show alone. We couldn't find each other. It just got too busy and we were standing and not in seats. So next time we'll probably stand again. This week's episode is special because we're a day removed from the show's first anniversary. The first three episodes of British Murders were released on December 3rd, 2020. I just want to thank every listener for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to my little one-man production of a true crime podcast. To be honest, I'm shocked that I actually stuck it out this long because typically I give up on things too soon. The biggest reason why I haven't done that with the podcast is because of you, my listeners. As with most indie podcasters, the thought of quitting comes and goes when life gets hectic, but luckily it's only ever a fleeting thought because I'll hear from one of my listeners and it gives me such a boost and it gives me that drive to carry on. So again, thank you so much everyone and here is to another year. With that mushy intro out of the way, let's kick off the show with this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. That was the jingle for Daddy Facts. For those who aren't aware, this is an opening icebreaker segment that involves me reading out a random dad fact from a pack of cards my daughter got me a few years ago. It's facts that every dad should know, and so far they've all been pretty useless. So here is this week's fact. The oldest known recipe for beer is over 4,000 years old. I like beer. But what a strange fact. 4,000... I wonder when that was written, like it matters. 4,000 years ago. 2,000 odd BC. Hmm. I wonder what it tastes like. I bet it tastes like shit. (laughs) With that done, let's move on to the second and final opening icebreaker segment of the show. It's time for this. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. Here is this week's haiku. I hope you're ready for this one. (laughs) <laughs> Try to jam it in. Success. A tight pussy hole, moistened by warm blood. And the image is, um, it looks like um, a sink or a plug hole with blood, you know, like from Psycho. That's, that's quite a graphic one, that. A haiku for those who are interested or have forgotten or want to know more about graphic poetry from Japan. It's a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of five, seven, and five. It's meant to be read in one breath. I get those from The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku by the infamous Rose Bundy. And there's a link in my bio if you would like to buy that and read more of those graphic, graphic Japanese poems. (laughs) With those two opening segments out of the way, let's move on to this week's episode. This week's case was suggested by listener Leo Anderson. Leo, who uses the online handle at Leo underscore is underscore hot 2005, he reached out to me on Instagram and asked if I had any stories from Clacton on Sea. I had a quick look online and I found today's story. Once I'd got the green light from Leo, I added it to my episode list, and here we are. As a reminder, this fourth season, we're nearly finished now, it's made up entirely of listener-suggested cases. Please do get in touch if you want me to cover a case and get a shout out for your efforts because season 5's episode list is now officially full. I had three case suggestions come in since last week's episode. Those have filled up the previously empty slots for episodes 8, 9 and 10 of season 5. I've even got a few more coming in and episode 6 is starting to build up as well. So please keep them coming in. Now is the time to do it if you want to get heard sooner rather than later. As always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. This week's location has already been revealed, but we are in the Essex town of Clacton-on-Sea for confirmation. Unfortunately, there aren't too many exciting things to tell you about this week's location, but regardless, let me tell you a factum about Clacton. Being a seaside town, the sea in question ironically being the North Sea, despite Clacton sitting in eastern England, Clacton has a pier. Exciting, huh? According to TripAdvisor, it's rated as the town's number three attraction. 
The second is the beach itself, and number one is Prince's Theatre. Opened in July 1871, here's the history part, Clacton Pier is the largest pleasure pier in the UK and covers six and a half acres, or 26,304.5667 square metres. It was named Pier of the Year in 2020 by the National Pier Society. Who knew there was such an award? Ever heard of the Battle of Pier Gap? Neither had I. This local battle took place in 1964 when two rival bike gangs clashed on Clacton's Beach. One gang, known as the Mods, short for Modernists, rode around on scooters and wore designer suits or parkas. The other gang, known as the Rockers, not Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, favoured motorcycles and wore leather and denim. They sounded like the more traditional biker gang out of the two. Basically, the two gangs vandalised the beach and each other. It was dubbed the Battle of Pier Gap by a local newspaper, the East Essex Gazette. If I'm being honest, there's not too much else to say about this quiet seaside town, so let me just introduce this week's villain. His name is Peter Reeve, and at the time of this story's events, he was 64 years old. Before starting, please be aware that this isn't one of those stories with an abundance of information available regarding the backgrounds of the killer or his victim. This is one of those local news stories that happened entirely out of the blue. We're going back in time nine years this week to 2012. It was a funny old year, wasn't it? 2012. It was the year the internet said the world would end. Obviously it didn't. An ancient Mayan prophecy was to blame. Though so was a fictional planet colliding with Earth, and a reverse in Earth's rotation. All bollocks of course, but I digress. In the UK, 2012 will go down in history as one of the wettest years on record. I'm talking about rain, by the way. It wasn't an arousing year by any stretch of the imagination. Bringing it back to the story, it began on Monday, July 9th, 2012. Police Constable Ian Dybell, a 41-year-old father of two, was enjoying a rare day off with his family at his home on Redbridge Road. He was blissfully unaware of the chaos about to ensue, just 265 feet away from his house. Peter Reeve was in his car and decided to confront one of Ian's neighbours, 48-year-old Trevor Marshall. Trevor was outside his home with his girlfriend, Katarzyna Karolak. Apparently my Welsh accent and my Welsh place names were shocking last week, so I'm guaranteed to have pronounced that name wrong. It's K-A-T-A-R-Z-Y-N-A, Katarzyna Karolak, K-A-R-O-L-A-K. Apologies if I am. Peter, who had been suffering from mental health problems for several years, believed that Trevor was dealing drugs. For some context, Peter was well known to the police, mental health services and a local counsellor. He was sectioned in 2001 under the Mental Health Act of 1983. To be sectioned in the UK is to be involuntarily committed and detained in a psychiatric hospital. According to an ex-wife, Peter was also described as being both sexist and racist. The racism part is especially relevant because Trevor Marshall is black. Peter was so convinced that Trevor was growing and dealing drugs that he complained to anyone that would listen about what he described as clunking noises coming from Trevor's house. Peter was adamant that the noises stemmed from growing weed and printing money. Here's an incredibly creepy part of the story. Peter once told a female neighbour that he couldn't say to the police about his drug suspicions because he thought he was being followed. By who? I don't know. Peter said, I will end up killing someone over this, and then I will turn the gun on myself. You'll realise why that's so creepy as the story progresses. After confronting Trevor Marshall from the safety of his own vehicle, Peter Reeve withdrew a gun and pointed it at him. The gun was a First World War British military issue Webley and Scott revolver manufactured in 1917. Upon seeing the weapon, Trevor immediately started to run in the opposite direction, as you would. Peter shot at Trevor several times, but only one bullet hit his target due to Trevor's clever zigzag running technique. After taking a bullet to the leg, Trevor screamed, Help! Help me! There's a man with a gun shooting at me and my girlfriend! 
before taking refuge in a local shop. Kastazanya Karolak was then shot at by Peter, but escaped into a neighbour's house physically unharmed. After hearing the shots outside, experienced PC Ian Dybell grabbed his warrant card, placed it in his back pocket, and made his way out onto the street, despite being off duty. Putting the safety of others ahead of his own, Ian ran towards the driver's side window of Peter's car. He leant in through the open window in an attempt to disarm the shooter, and a scuffle ensued. It's unclear what happened during that brief struggle, but we know that Peter's weapon was discharged. Sadly, the gun was aimed at PC Diabell when the bullet left the chamber. The bullet went through Ian's right palm and into his chest, collapsing his lung in the process. After shooting PC Diabell, Peter fled the scene in his Toyota and crashed it into a wall shortly after. He then continued to flee on foot. A total of 23 calls were made to 999 by witnesses from 3.37pm until the police arrived 16 minutes later at 3.53pm. One female witness said, I heard a lot of commotion at about 3.40 near the flats at the end of the street. I didn't know what was going on. There's still a lot of commotion in the street. I saw a man running up the road. I don't know anyone involved in what's happened. The whole road has been cordoned off. My husband isn't being allowed back to our house. 83-year-old Patrick Mooney had been out shopping at the time of the attack and was surprised at the heavy police presence near his home when he got back at around 4pm. He said, I was escorted back to my house by police and told, stay inside. I didn't ask what was going on and they didn't tell me. Another Redbridge Road neighbour named Hazel Field said, I was in the garden at the time and heard a gunshot, followed by a woman's scream. Then I heard another gunshot, followed by about five more. Peter is thought to have discharged his weapon between seven and ten times in total during the melee. Another witness said, We were standing outside and heard what we thought was a dog howling, and then we realised it was a woman screaming. We heard a man shouting, and then there was another series of gunshots before it went quiet. It must have been about 10 to 15 minutes later that we heard police sirens. Unfortunately, PC Ian Dybell was pronounced dead at the scene by paramedics. His neighbours had performed CPR, but were unable to resuscitate him. He had suffered fatal damage to his aorta, along with the collapsed lung. The aorta is the body's primary artery, and it's also the largest. One can only assume that the bullet damaged Ian's aorta beyond repair and he bled to death exceptionally quickly. Another sad part of the story is that adults weren't the only witnesses to this heinous crime. The time of the attack coincided with schools finishing for the day and various primary school aged children witnessed the attacks. In the UK, primary schools generally cater for kids between the ages of 4 and 11. Police spoke to the children in question as well as their head teacher. My research indicates that no counselling was required for any of them. What a brave bunch. If you're wondering what happened to Peter Reeve after crashing his car and fleeing on foot, let me tell you. He bumped into a local man named Ivor Starling and asked him how to organise booking a taxi. Ivor, a 74-year-old retired truck driver, noted that Peter looked on edge and that his face was flushed. Peter said to him, I've had such a terrible, terrible, terrible day. If I told you how terrible it is, you could never believe me. I need a taxi. Ivor initially offered for Peter to use his house phone to book a taxi, but that offer was rejected. Peter instead agreed it would be best if he caught a train instead of booking a taxi. At 6.21pm, CCTV footage shows Peter Reeve on a train going from Wheelie to Colchester Town Centre Station. He then travelled on to Colchester North Station before arriving in Chelmsford at 7.57pm. He had friends and family in Essex's county town and visited his sister, Janet Hines. Peter asked Janet if she would put him up for the night, but she refused. Essex police, meanwhile, started hunting Peter and told the public that he was armed, dangerous and should not be approached under any circumstances. He was described as a white, 5 foot 10 inch male with short greyish hair. He was said to be wearing jeans and possibly glasses, however the CCTV images I've seen suggest otherwise with regards to the glasses. 
After being sent on his way by his sister, Peter made his way to the village of Rittle, located a mile west of Chelmsford. It was in Rittle where Peter's mum was buried. She took her own life over 30 years earlier after taking a pill overdose. Details of what happened overnight aren't precise, but it appears as though Peter was simply walking around the local village. On the morning of Tuesday, July 10th, 2012, Peter found himself in the graveyard of Rittles All Saint Church. This is pure conjecture, but I'm guessing that maybe was where his mum was buried? Peter spoke with David Coyler that morning after the gardener had arrived to cut the churchyard's grass. Peter said, Sorry for shooting the police constable. If this doesn't work, I have got plenty more ammo in my pocket. Imagine arriving at work and hearing that. Peter then withdrew his gun, placed it against his forehead and pulled the trigger. He died instantly. I'll remind you of Peter's foreboding comment from earlier in the episode. I will end up killing someone over this and then I will turn the gun on myself. How right he was. Peter Reeves' body was discovered by a member of the public shortly after 8.30am on July 10th, 2012. His body, along with a handgun, was found on the western edge of the churchyard among several graves. I found myself asking the question of how Peter managed to acquire a handgun. He didn't have a firearms license, and he certainly wouldn't have been able to acquire one for the type of gun he had. Essex Police's Chief Constable Jim Barker McArdle said, I can confirm Peter Reeve, the man wanted for the murder of a serving police officer, was found dead, with a weapon, in a Rittle churchyard and no shots were fired by the police. He went on to say, Ian was an experienced and professional neighbourhood police officer who deliberately intervened in what he knew was an extremely deadly situation. Policing is a family and we are all hurting. This dreadful event reminds us all that policing is a mission that ultimately some die for. We remain deeply proud of Ian and the sacrifice he made for the safety of others. He had an incredible devotion to his community and Essex police and his actions will never be forgotten. It was later revealed that Peter had written a letter to his friend Eric Long before ending his own life. In what can be interpreted as a suicide note, Peter wrote the following. I could not take any more of them to planning to put a syringe in my back and then set me alight, let alone the drug dealing and printing factory going on every day and night, even Christmas and Boxing Day. So it was worked by them, and if they was at work, I had others come in. What is done is done. I will take my own life, but I am really sorry for Mr. Ian Diabell and his family. The gun went off as Ian was tugging at my door. I hit another car I didn't want to hit because it had children in. If we take that at face value, it would appear that Peter claims to have shot PC Diabell accidentally. Whether that's true or not, sadly, we'll never know. Yvette Cooper, who served as the Shadow Home Secretary from 2011 to 2015, said, We are all reminded that police officers on or off duty put themselves in harm's way to protect the public, and they have our greatest admiration for their bravery, for what they do, and the risks they take daily to keep us safe. PC Ian Dybell's funeral was held at St. John the Baptist Church on what I believe was July 15th, 2012. Having said that, my research also said that the service was held at Wheelie Crematorium on July 31st, 2012. Perhaps both are correct. Regardless, Reverend Guy Thorburn led a 35-minute funeral service that was attended by over 200 people. Ian's colleagues formed a guard of honour outside as the hearse drove past. In December 2013, the Queen posthumously awarded Ian the George Medal. He was the first police officer in the country to receive the award in 21 years and the first ever in Essex. Bit of history briefly about the George Medal. It was instituted on September 24th, 1940 by King George VI. So he was the previous, you know, king slash queen before Elizabeth II, our current queen. And it's a UK decoration, also known as GM, George Medal. Awarded for gallantry, courage, whatever you want to call it. In November 2015, the Police Memorial Trust organised a service in which a memorial stone was revealed by then Prime Minister David Cameron. 
The stone reads, Near here fell PC Ian Andrew Dybell, GM. 9 July 2012. And that was a story of British murderer Peter Reeve. Thanks again to Leo Anderson for suggesting a Clacton case. I've got no new reviews to read out this week, unfortunately, but suppose you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode. If so, you can do that on iTunes, Podchaser, or Facebook. All reviews help increase the show's exposure, and they are greatly appreciated. It's such a massive boost hearing from my fans. I love it. You can support British Murders each month by joining my Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash britishmurders. You'll get early access to ad-free episodes and access to my scripts if you join up. If you prefer to support the show on a one-off basis, please visit buymeacoffee.com slash britishmurders. That's what listener Tamar Powsland did on November 25th. Tamar bought me three beers and left a message that said, Thank you for making this awesome podcast. You keep me company while I work and when I drive. Keep up the good work. Also, a case based in Cornwall would be cool. Thank you so much, Tamar, for buying me those three beers. I've made a note for episode 9 of season 5 to cover a Cornwall case and give you a shout out. I haven't picked the case yet, so please get in touch if you find one before me. For more on British murders, please check out all my social media channels and YouTube. Merchandise is available to purchase at Teespring. The link is in the description. And please, 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 I know I go on about it all the time, but please continue to email case suggestions to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or just message me on social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you will get a shout out as well. There's your incentive. Well, that's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.